Good afternoon. Alice Gordon earned her PhD in economics from the University of Michigan and was a professor of economics here at Oakland University throughout the 70s and 80s. She was the first female faculty member in the School of Business Administration. Alice Gordon made her mark as a scholar in the area of Soviet studies. She was also a gifted teacher and a generous faculty mentor. Because she cared passionately about international issues, the Gordon Lecture Series, named in her honor, has accepted as its mission to promote understanding of international issues and events. I would now like to introduce you to our 2016 Gordon Lecturer. He is Dr. Peter Blair Henry. Dr. Henry earned undergraduate degrees from the University of North Carolina and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He went on to MIT, where he earned a PhD in economics. Dr. Henry is currently the William R. Berkeley Professor of Economics and Finance and Dean of New York University's Stern School of Business. And he's a former professor of international economics at Stanford University. He's also the author of Turnaround, Third World Lessons for First World Growth. A member of the board of the National Bureau of Economic Research and of the Council of Foreign Relations, he was awarded the Foreign Policy Association Medal, the highest honor bestowed by the Foreign Policy Association in 2015. In that same year, he was elected to the board of directors of a leading global bank, the city. Dr. Henry will address us today on the topic, Capital and Labor in the 21st Century, A Cautionary Tale. It is our very great honor and privilege to have him here at Oakland University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to the 2016 Alice Connor Golden Memorial Lecturer, Dr. Peter Blair Henry. Thank you, Professor Copen and Dean Mizzou. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here. I'm only taking my focus. I want to make sure I watch the time. I just realized that um, I want to stay on time here today. So I'm just gonna, I'm turning on my phone not to check my messages, but just to make sure that uh, we allow plenty of time for questions. So I wanna talk today, I wanna have a data-driven conversation that really helps us think about the intersection of capital and labor and some very long-run implications. So I'm gonna ask you today to think with me, not about the world over the next three or four years, or even five years, but 10, 15, 20 years, kind of the long-term trajectory that we're on. Like many of you, I observe um, the world around us here in this country uh, and abroad, what I would characterize as an increasing dissatisfaction, and I think justified dissatisfaction, of the middle class and certainly the working class in advanced countries uh, over the last decade plus with rising income inequality, uh, wage stagnation, and a general sense, we talked about this a bit at lunch today, that tomorrow may not be better than today for the next generation for the first time in this country. I think there's real justified concern about that. And I think we're seeing um, that concern come out. It doesn't matter where you stand on the political spectrum. I think on both sides of the spectrum, there's what I would call a rising sort of sentiment of, of what I would call populism. And by populism, I don't mean that I don't mean that term pejoratively, but I mean the classic sense of the word, an appeal to popular ideas that may not be in the best long-run interest of, uh, of the nation. And so what I want to do today is, if you'll be patient with me, I want to weave together uh, some facts and some data to paint a long-run picture of the danger of succumbing to, again, I want to underscore justified sentiments real dissatisfaction with the way things are and a sense of where things are going. But as the saying goes, there's no 
wrong way to get to the right place. And it turns out there are a multiplicity of well-intentioned <laughs> means that can get you to a very wrong place economically. Okay, so the desire for equity <coughs> has to be, and this is one of, the, one of the great lessons of economics, right? The body politic can have many different points of view about what is fair, what is just, what is equitable. But what economics, what is what, 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 economics at its very best, uh, and I'm really pleased to be giving this Gorlin lecture, um, and I think Dr. Gorlin, I think, would appreciate this point because she was a study of comparative economics. You can look at a wide range of countries. I'm going to make allusion to a number of countries today. What economics tells us is that asking the question about what's efficient can provide great insight into whether well-meaning intentions are actually likely to deliver on those intentions in the long run or actually just deliver heartache. And that's the broader context for the discussion I want to have today, and that's where I'm, what motivates uh, my thinking. Okay, so with that, let me show you some data. <laughs> and I just want to make, uh, make one comment. This lecture is largely motivated by uh, a number of themes that I, uh, that I address uh, in this book that uh, Professor Coppin made allusion to, uh, third world, Turnaround, Third World Lessons for First World Growth. So if you're interested more broadly in exploring some of these themes, um, I would encourage you to, to take a look. So I'm going to spend some time on a single figure. This is a graph of the growth rates of GDP in advanced economies and in emerging and developing countries, uh, roughly from the, from the period 1980 through 2015. And I want you to notice several things about this figure. The very first thing to notice about the figure, uh, which is the motivation for the title of the graph, global growth is not a zero-sum game, are the following facts. So if you look at the advanced economies, which are, the dash, are depicted by the dashed line, <coughs> and the data are taken from the International Monetary Fund, you'll see that the average growth rate of GDP uh, in the advanced economies, uh, if you take the average over that whole period, is about 2.8%. From 1980 through 1992, uh, it's roughly 2.9%. Uh, 2 and from 1983 through 2015, it's about 2.8% per year. If you look at the emerging and developing economies, uh, what you'll notice is that the growth rate over the whole sample uh, is quite different in the two different halves of the sample. The growth rate for the emerging economies uh, in the first half of the sample from 1980 to 1992 is about 3.4 percent per year. In the second half of the sample from 1993 onwards, the growth rate for the emerging economies is 5.5 percent per year. So the very first point to note is, well, there are two points to note. One, the average growth rate for the emerging economies increased substantially post-1992. Uh, the question is why? I'm going to come to that. Okay? But first, let's, let's just observe the fact first. And the second point is there's no difference, significant difference between the growth rate of the growth rate of advanced economies over the two halves of the sample. So in other words, the increased rate of growth in emerging economies did not come in any statistically meaning sense at the cost of growth in advanced economies. Now, for those of us who have studied economics, that seems like an almost obvious thing to say to why would you ex expect there to be a, a zero-sum relationship? We don't expect that, but again, in the broader context of what I, what I referred to earlier, in the popular press, in the narrative mind of the public, not just in this country, but in many countries, there's a story told us the rise of emerging markets implicitly means the eclipse of advanced economies. And just a very simple observation of the data tells us that there's no reason to believe that's the case. There's no, there's, no, there's no basis for that. The acceleration in growth in, in emerging economies did not come as a, uh, at the cost of slower growth in the advanced economies. 
So just observe that, observe that fact. And I would also point out that the rapid growth, which took place in emerging economies, relatively rapid growth, uh, in 2010 uh, and still higher growth than in advanced economies even now, was largely responsible for helping drive the recovery <coughs> such as it is in the advanced economies. So in other words, as we know, rapid growth in emerging economies is actually good for growth in advanced economies. So that's the first observation. Global growth is not a zero-sum game, and I want to come, I'm going to come back to that point. But also, what's true across countries can also be true within countries. So advanced econ adv emerging economies have grown more rapidly, not at the expense of advanced economies. But there's also scope for positive-sum growth within countries as well, even though, as I said, there's been a substantial increase in income inequality. So I want to come back to that point. So let me just highlight, at, this, for the, at the risk of being obvious, why growth matters so much. That two percentage point increase in the growth rate of GDP in the developing nations, what does that really mean? Right? What it really means is the following thing. When a, if a country, let's take a country whose population growth is 1% per year, if it's growing at 3.5% per year, its GDP is growing at 3.5% per year. Its GDP per capita is growing at 2.5% per year. Similarly, if it's growing at 5.5% per year, its GDP per capita is growing at 4.5% per year. So that simple two percentage point difference in growth rates is a difference between the average standard of living in a country doubling once every 29 years in the case of 3.5% growth versus once every 16 years at 5.5% growth. In other words, it's a 13, it takes 13 years less to double standards of living if you just increase your growth rate of GDP by two percentage points. Now, it's no mean feat to increase your growth rate on average by two percentage points. Okay? Uh, but the point is, growth really matters. And within less than a generation, it can make a real difference just getting your growth rate up by two percentage points of GDP, two, two percentage points. So that's why growth matters, and that's why this picture uh, is, is so important. Okay? So over the last <coughs> 35 years, there's an ex a rapid increase in the growth rate of GDP in emerging economies. And the question is, why? How did this turnaround occur? Okay? So, much of what I want to talk about is what, in fact, drove that turnaround in the emerging economies. And I'm going to argue that a single word encapsulates what happened. And that single word is discipline. Okay? By discipline, I don't mean fiscal austerity. By discipline, what I mean is a, a, coher a coherent, pragmatic, a sustained commitment to a pragmatic growth strategy that values what's good for the country as a whole over what's good for any individual, interest group, or person running for political office. And by the way, a sustained commitment <coughs> to that pragmatic growth strategy has to be both vigilant and flexible. Meaning, vigilant in the sense of having a vision for driving pragmatic growth over the long run, not losing sight of that, drive for efficiency, but being flexible enough to adjust tactically as circumstances change in the short run. So an example, might, just to give you a simple example, what am I talking about? Think about fiscal policy. Right? Fiscal policy. Discipline in fiscal policy does not mean fiscal austerity. It means simply counter the ability and the willingness to run countercyclical fiscal policy, meaning that when times are good, governments ought to run surpluses, save those surpluses. So when times are bad, there's actually a buffer stock from which to 
run countercyclical fiscal policy to stimulate the economy if necessary. Right? So that's no more complicated than I like to tell the story of the ant and the grasshopper, right? In Aesop's fables. Okay. So that is that is just a very simple example of what I mean uh, with respect to, uh, to fiscal policy. But I'm going to show you. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to walk you through what discipline looks like with respect to some other policies. Now, I mean, a very important historical backdrop as well here is you know where did where did this idea of discipline come from? This idea of discipline really seems to be the common thread that runs through a set of a sea change in the view about what developing countries needed to do in order to start growing uh, that emerged in the mid 1980s. So in October of 1985, uh, the, what, were, what are now called the uh, de uh, developing and emerging economies were called third world countries. And they were mired in what was called the, the third world debt crisis. Uh, they were on, many of them were in default on their loans. And there was a danger of creating a, uh, a systemic problem with the world financial system. And at the time, James A. Baker III, who was the then US Secretary of the Treasury, uh, went to Seoul, South Korea, and made a very famous speech called a program for sustained growth, in which he outlined essentially 10 principles that in his view, the Treasury's view, the World Bank and the IMF's view, that developing that third world countries need to adhere to in order to start growing again and be able to service their debts. And this 10 point program for sustained growth became known as the so-called Washington Consensus. Discipline does not mean dogmatic adherence to each of the 10 points listed on the Washington Consensus. Everything from privatization to freer trade, freer flow of, for goods and capital, um, and the need for uh, fiscal soundness. But a disciplined growth strategy means looking at that list of 10 market-friendly reforms and understanding for a given country, for your country as a policymaker, which particular reforms are going to have the most bang for the buck? Obviously, figuring out what's doable, because policy is the art of what's possible, and then constructing a strategy around those things. And so, in different countries, different subsets of those policies were put in place. It was different in South Korea than it was in Brazil, than it was in China. And I won't get into great detail about those countries today. But behind these averages and these inc this increase in average growth that took place lie many different stories of turnaround. But the common thread that runs through all those stories of turnaround to the extent that they happened is discipline. All right, so let me show you um, a picture of what discipline looks like. This is a graph <clears throat> of the average rate of uh, CPI inflation uh, in developing countries. Uh, and I have it running through 2014, so roughly the same period, 1981-2014. to <coughs> This is not a mistake. The average growth rate of, sorry, the average inflation rate in emerging economies, uh, circa 1994, about 100, over 120 percent per year, and inflation rates at that level, as high in places like Brazil, in excess of a thousand percent per year, very hard to do any rational economic planning. Inflation takes over, has real costs in the economy, and uh, creates volatility, uncertainty about the future, and is bad for economic growth. And what you see here, the obvious is. Post-1994, so I told you Baker's speech was in 1985, and so it took a while, on average, before countries really began to get discipline. But starting in 1994, you see a sea change in the emerging world, this dramatic fall in inflation. And I'm not saying that the fall in inflation is the only aspect of discipline, but this single graph best captures the spirit of the sea change in the average point of view about what constituted good policy in emerging markets from the perspective of policymakers. Okay? So if you want to think about you know, when did this shift towards discipline happen on average, get on average, there's a lot of variation here. You can think about 
fall, this dramatic fall in inflation starting in 1994 is a rough proxy for that. Now, there are other policies as well. Openness to trade in goods, openness to trade in capital. And I want to talk a little bit about um, what the impact of these various policies were on the cost of capital. Because again, remember, what I want to do here, I want to tie in the importance of capital to this acceleration in growth. Okay. And just to make the point even more clear, what you see here, uh, kind of post-2010, you see that there's been this decline in global growth. So since 2011, in every successive year, global growth has gotten slower from about 3.8% uh, in 2010 to about 3.1% last year. And in the face of slower global growth, again, has been this rising kind of populist, what I call sort of anti-capitalist sentiment. And the punchline of the story is, is my concern is that this anti-capitalist sort of populist sentiment is going to undermine or make us lose track of the fact that in many, in large part, it was capital played a significant role in driving this round of prosperity in, in the emerging world. Okay, so that's where I'm going. Okay, so let me turn to this next figure. <coughs> what I've done is I've plotted the average cost of capital in emerging economies uh, versus the United States uh, again, over roughly the period from 1935, uh, roughly a 30-plus 30, 30 year period, from 1981 to 2014. So let me just explain what I've done here. This is, a, this is a, a plot of the earnings price, the average earnings price ratio for the aggregate stock market in emerging economies versus, the, I'm using the U.S. here as kind of a world benchmark. Okay? The earnings price ratio you can think of for a country as a whole as the cost of equity capital. So earnings price ratio is essentially comprised of the risk-free rate and the aggregate equity premium. And what you see is there's a dramatic fall in the average cost of equity capital for emerging economies. Again, starting in the 1980s, you, know, uh, you can see it sort of peaks in 1982, the beginning of the debt crisis, and then falls pretty consistently sort of uh, from about 14.4% on average in the period prior to 1994 to about 7.1% on average after that. Why is that? I'm going to argue that it's discipline in the following sense. A range of things are happening. So one, think about the fall in inflation. Okay? And think about the real cost of inflation in terms of just generating more uncertainty in the economy. You can think about that as driving up risk premium. Okay? So part of what's going on is you see the fall in the earnings yield, the fall in the cost of capital, equity capital in emerging markets, is just a fall in risk that's coming from the elimination <coughs> of very high inflation. But there's also, and more, and more generally, as there's a shift towards more uh, a more market-driven point of view about economic policy with respect to trade, uh, respect to, with respect to uh, privatizing state of enterprises, there's just less uncertainty in general about the, about the direction of economic policy in these countries. And all of that contributes, you can think of that as contributing to a lower overall risk premium. But another very important reform takes place in these countries during this period of time which is that they actually open themselves up to free flows of capital. So prior to the late <coughs> 1980s and early 1990s, as part of post-colonial economic policymaking, there's extreme aversion, that's putting it mildly, extreme aversion to foreign ownership of domestic capital domestic assets. So 
there's a lot of uh, borrowing in the form of debt, but very little financing into emerging markets in the form of foreign equity. That changes in the late 1980s, early 1990s, as, emerge, as, uh, as third world countries begin to actually open their stock markets to foreign investors. In fact, I'm uh, proud to say, just as an aside, was a stern alum, Antoine von Achmel, who first coined the term emerging markets. Uh, as the story goes, he was uh, making a pitch. He was then working for a New York investment bank. Oh, he actually was working for the IFC, the International Finance Corporation. He was making a pitch to a New York investment bank about the prospect of investing in what he was calling third world stocks. And he made the argument uh, that there were prospectively high rates of return and low correlations in these markets. And the, the, the investment banking firm uh, is, told to, is, is said to have said that this is a great idea, but a lousy name. <laughs> so get rid of the name third world, and that's where he came up with the term emerging markets. Okay. Um, so it was right around the late 1980s, early 1990s, when, these, when countries like Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, began opening up in various forms, usually first in the, in the, in the form of allowing countries, allowing foreigners to buy into a closed-end mutual fund, began opening up their stock markets. So you think about that from, from a neoclassical perspective, that means the supply of capital to these economies is increasing. So your standard growth model, right, you're driving down the risk-free rate at the same time you're driving down the equity premium. Both of those things work to reduce the cost of equity capital to drive down the earnings yield. So what you have is a transition to a lower cost of capital in emerging markets as a result of opening up. Now, here's the other side of that picture. This is really just telling the same story in a, from a different way, actually showing you the flows of capital rather than the prices. <coughs> These are equity inflows to emerging economies. And what you see is, again, prior to the late 1980s, early 1990s, the flow of equity capital in emerging economies is virtually nil. Okay? And there's a huge spike a rapid increase in capital flows to emerging economies in the form of equity inflows. And let me be very clear here, by equity inflows I mean both portfolio equity and FDI. An important point to note, I mentioned the debt crisis. A big part of what's happening in these emerging economies is they're opening the stock market to foreign investment. Yes, it's portfolio equity, but there's, there's also a lot of foreign direct investment in the form of uh, foreigners taking greater than a 10% share in these countries. And in fact, that's a big part of how the private, a, 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 a large number of privatizations actually transpired in places like Mexico. Because again, remember, there's an irony here. These were countries that were, uh, it, that forbid foreign ownership of domestic equity, but yet were trying to finance development strictly through debt. And then ironically, ended up selling off domestic assets anyway because of the debt crisis, getting over leveraged essentially. And much of the portfolio equity investment into these countries that's taking place around the opening up is in fact the acquisition of previously state-owned enterprises being floated on the stock market. So I just want to make that point. That's part of the, the, the equity inflow. So, just to put the story together so far, opening up of the, foreign, of the stock market to foreign investment allows for dramatic inflow of capital, reduces the cost of capital, and very importantly, yes, assets get repriced, valuations go higher, but think about, and for the students in the audience, connecting Finance with macroeconomics. There's a drop in your cost of capital. Prior to opening up, countries are at a steady state equilibrium where the cost of capital is equal to the respective rate of return on capital. 
You have a real shock, which is a policy change that drives, that opens up the market, drives down the cost of capital. And so now some projects that were negative net present value projects become positive net present value projects. In other words, there's incentive to invest in real physical capital because of that fall in earnings yields, right? And that's the capital labor nexus, right? So I haven't put the graph here, but there's a substantial increase in the growth rate of the capital stock of these countries. Capital stock growth rates increased by more than a percentage point per year on average in the, fi in, in the five years following liberalization in these countries. Well, what does it have to do with labor? Well, again, this is why the solo growth models stood the test of time. As a marginal product of capital, <coughs> uh, as the rate of return to capital, uh, as the cost of capital falls, there's an increase in, the, in, in, in capital accumulation the marginal product of labor rises. Workers are made productive as they have better machines and equipment to work with. Okay? So if we actually look at the data, what we see in the post-liberalization period, wages, in the real, real wages in the manufacturing sector in these countries also rise substantially. And as I recall, the average increase in the, in the take-home pay of workers in the manufacturing sector of developing countries that liberalize the stock market, go up by about uh, by about a fifth of their their take home pay increases by about, by about a fifth above and beyond what it would have increased in the absence of liberalization. So this acceleration in growth that I showed you earlier that takes place in emerging markets. A big part of the story of this, average, this increase in growth from 3.4% per year to 5.5% per year is driven by certainly the real policy changes that reduce uncertainty and that also increase the efficiency of capital. But they're also driven by greater access to capital. And so policies that enhance the profitability of capital and work to reduce the cost of capital also work to the benefit of labor. And this is particularly important to remember <coughs> because we find ourselves in a moment where there's some staggering numbers to consider. So one of the great stories that lies you know, behind this solid line here is the story of China. And from 1978 through 2012, China had probably the single most miraculous increase in economic prosperity the world has ever seen since we've had proper GDP numbers. And over that period of time, we know China lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But let's think about the labor force for a second. Over that period of time, China added, and the reason why I stopped in 2012 is in 2012, the Chinese workforce stopped growing. So between 1978 and 2012, the labor force in China was, in, was, was growing. And on a monthly basis, from 1978 to 2012, China added about 1.1 million workers per month to the labor force, okay? That's a staggering number. I have an even more staggering number for you. From 2015 to 2030, the least developed countries of the world are going to add 1.7 million workers per month to the workforce. That means we've got to find essentially 1.7 million jobs per month to employ people to stop, the un stop unemployment from rising in these countries. Now, what does it have to do with the capital labor story? Well. I showed you this dramatic increase in capital flows to emerging markets. <laughs> post-crisis, post-global financial crisis, uh, we're not seeing the kinds of capital flows, global capital flows we saw previously. Global capital flows as a percentage of GDP have not recovered to pre-crisis levels. Part of that is a function of the structural adjustment of the financial system. But it also takes place in the context of what I referred to earlier <coughs> as 
this rise in populist slash anti-capitalist sentiment. And the reason why this is concerning is because of these 1.7 million workers per month who are coming into the workforce, right? Microfinance can do a lot, but Kickstarter is not going to get us 1.7 million jobs per month in the developing world. For that, we need <clears throat> major capital flows. And so the point is policies, disciplined policies, yes, they benefit capital, but they're also critical to the improved welfare of labor as well. Let me... Um, let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so this example is uh, personal for me. It's a story of two islands, Jamaica and Barbados. Professor Kopp and I know is from Barbados, so I guess we have the two islands represented on opposite sides of the room here today. <laughs> so what I've done here is I've graphed the average and index of GDP per capita in Jamaica and Barbados, and I've artificially started them at the same point in 1960, although there, there were some differences there. Jamaica began at about, at that point in time, <coughs> it was about $3,000 per capita. Uh, Barbados was about uh, $4,500 per capita. And the picture is in some ways self-explanatory. It's divergence, big time. If we fast forward, uh, through 2010, the average GDP per, uh, per capita in Barbados is uh, over $10,000. Jamaica is about $5,000. Let me add to this, Barbados did not experience an economic miracle. Barbados, I think, on average over this period is growing actually probably a little less than 2% per year per capita terms. So this is, not, this is not an Asian miracle by any standard. And I'll talk more in detail about some of the policy differences in a second. But basically, this is sort of steady as you go growth. Gets them from around $5,000 per capita to uh, almost mid-teens of thousands of dollars per capita. And so that the, the, the difference between the average level of income in Barbados and Jamaica today, just the difference between those incomes, is greater than the overall average standard of living in Jamaica today. Now, the natural question to ask is why? What happened? So think, you can think about Bar Barbados and Jamaica as essentially as being a double click on one of those emerging, one of them, that emerging economy line that I showed you earlier. So we're kind of digging in a little bit more micro now to show you what happened. And the difference is policy. Barbados was disciplined, Jamaica was not. <laughs> to put it simply. What do I mean by that? Well, you see, between 1960 and 1972, very similar trajectories. Very similar trajectories. Um, and it's very tempting, and it's a story that Jamaican policymakers have told, well, in 1972, there's an oil price shock. That hurts a lot of countries. But... <laughs> That oil price shock hits Jamaica and Barbados in the same way. So we have kind of a, a quasi-natural experiment here. We have two countries, similar parts of the world, almost identical institutions, English common law, property rights, <coughs> even the Anglican church, right? So they're about as, they're about as close to twins as you can imagine. Um, hit by this same shock and diverge in outcomes. So what happens? In 1972, uh, a politician by the name of Michael Manley runs for prime minister in Jamaica. Michael Manley runs under the banner of democratic socialism. Again, going back to the thing I, made, I, po I pointed to earlier, justified means, Jamaica gets independence in 1962. It's a poor country. Many people want a better way of life. Manly promises to give it to them. 
He wants widespread education, more housing, jobs, all those things that we all want for all of our citizens. The question is, how are you going to deliver it? So Manley runs under the slogan, better must come. He runs a very popular campaign, an extremely charismatic man. He's the son of uh, uh, a national hero. And Manley wins over 60% of the popular vote and does something really quite unprecedented. He wins, he, he wins a majority, not only of uh, the working poor and the rural vote, he also wins a majority of the business vote. Because they see Manley, because Jamaica in this post-independence period is suffering from a lot of um, uh, socioeconomic strife, uh, uh, real class tension. And Manley is seen, in a lot of strikes, labor stoppages, and Manley is seen as a person who can actually bridge this gap under this better must come democratic socialism banner. But then when Manley actually takes office and it becomes clear what his policy, what democratic socialism actually means, and what better must come actually means. And it turns out it means we are going to be an independent country in every sense of the word. We want to be self sufficient. So we're going to make our own products in every place that we can. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to ban imports in certain areas in the interest of becoming self reliant. We're going to inject the government hand in many areas of national industry, so on and so forth. And you can see the consequences. Manley's strategies, Manley's policies, actually have a major negative impact on the country. From 1972 uh, through 1980, which is when Manley was eventually, was eventually voted out of office, GDP contracted every single year. Negative growth from 1972 through 1980. Over that same period of time from 1972 through 1980, the stock market lost 90% of its value. So Man and, and Manley, who had run on this platform of helping workers. Let me tell you what happened uh, to workers during that period. So I talked to you about the importance of uh, capital for labor. Well, during that period, as the stock market is losing 90% of its value, the capital stock in Jamaica, which between 1962 and 1972 had grown at 4.3% per year, right? Part of what's driving that growth, okay? Investment in, in plant and equipment grew by only 0.4% from 1973 to 1988. So a 3.9 percentage point decrease from the previous period, and not even fast enough to keep up with depreciation. So effectively, over this period, you have a decapitalization of the economy. Okay? And in fact, seven out of the 10 years during that period, the capital stock in Jamaica, the real capital stock actually declined. So what happened to workers from 1970 to 1980? Real wages fell by 130%. By the time Manley left office in 1980, unemployment stood at 30%. So brilliant man, well-meaning, but his policies his antagonism towards capital. In fact, in, in 1975, Manley made a very famous speech. This was in, towards the end of his first term in office, as there was great disillusion with the plummeting economy. Business people were pushing back. Michael Manley made a famous speech in the National Stadium, which he said, Jamaica has no room for millionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, there are five flights a day to Miami. Turns out rhetoric matters. People took him at his word and left the country. So this anti-business, anti-capitalist stance had dramatic consequences, not only for capital, but also for labor. 
So coming back then to where I started, 1.1 million workers per month were absorbed during China's rapid economic rise. Over the next 15 years, the least developed countries of the world need to absorb 1.7 million workers per month. So one and a half times as many workers need to be absorbed by those countries as were absorbed by the country that produced the most miraculous economic rise the world has ever seen. And the question is, will we be able to do that without sensible policies towards the free flow of capital in an environment of reduced global capital flows? In an environment of zero-sum thinking across countries as well as within countries. And very importantly, the zero-sum thinking within countries right now is really most thrown into relief in advanced nations, the United States, Western Europe. But because we haven't seen growth, the kind of recovery post-financial crisis that we've seen uh, after previous recessions, we settle into this zero-sum thinking within countries, within advanced countries, that is then bleeding into zero-sum thinking across countries from advanced countries to emerging economies in the form of greater protectionism with respect to trade and greater hostility towards free movement of capital and towards capital in general. So this is a slow moving picture, but for me, the contrast of Jamaica and Barbados, these two Caribbean twins, if you will, strike me as a very powerful cautionary tale. And you might be inclined to say, you know, what's the, what are the similarities between, surely you can't be drawing similarities between Jamaica and the United States. But better must come, it can be said with a Jamaican accent or an accent of your choosing. It's the sentiment. And the question is, will we have the discipline as an electorate and as elected officials to learn from the lessons of history about what actually generates growth versus what destroys growth as we consider policies to address legitimate social concerns. So I, wanna, I just wanna, I wanna underline and underscore legitimate social concerns. That's not, I, that's not the issue. The issue is how do we put in place policies that are gonna be efficient, that are actually gonna generate higher standards of living. And just to take you back to this picture, where do we find ourselves? <clears throat> Again, we had a terrible financial crisis, worldwide recession, recovery in 2010, global growth to 3.8%. Every year since, <clears throat> global growth has been slower. Every year since, in the middle of the year, the IMF forecast for growth has been slower in the second half of the year than in the first half of the year. All of this has created a zero-sum mindset within countries that is bleeding into a zero-sum mindset across countries. And in order to get out of this, we gotta remember that we all need discipline. We have to rediscover discipline in advanced nations, meaning that the reforms that through the IMF and the, and, the, and the World Bank, countries like the United States and, Western, and countries of Western Europe, countries of the Eurozone, pushed onto third world countries who kicking and screaming, I'll add, adopted a significant number of these reforms and had a substantial turnaround in growth between 1993 and 2007. 
question is, will advanced nations actually look themselves in the mirror and say, wait a minute, we have a, we're suffering from a number of the characteristics that third world countries suffered from. The need for structural reform labor markets in Europe, greater product market competition, the need for debt relief, plus structural reforms in Greece. Notice I didn't say one or the other, it's both. Again, the lesson there is if you look at the Latin American countries during the third world debt crisis, James Baker himself, who pushed the Washington consensus and was adamant in the first instance when he first made his speech in 1985 and testified before Congress in 1986 that there'd be no debt relief. Without debt relief, there was no recovery. There was no turnaround in emerging markets. And in 1989, under Secretary Brady, there's something called the Brady Plan, which said, yes, we need the reforms that Baker pushed, but we also need to recognize that the debts are both a, a problem for both creditors and debtors, and we need to have haircuts and, and, and get the books clean. And it was with the combination of debt relief and reforms that we actually experienced and saw these turnarounds in third world countries. But there's no recognition of this in the case of Greece and in Europe. And it's ironic that Germany continues to insist that there be no debt relief for Greece when the Germans themselves suffered the consequences of insistence on paying the debt after World War I, which led to hyperinflation, the rise of the Weimar Republic, and you know the rest of the history. And there was actually debt, was debt relief for Germany post-World War II. So very important lessons. We need to rediscover discipline in advanced nations. For the emerging nations, a lot of work to do there as well. During the period of quantitative easing, post-financial crisis, there was an opportunity for emerging markets to continue second stage reforms, to continue deepening the reforms that generated the turnaround for, for many of them between 1993 and 2007. Much of that hasn't happened, whether it be the financial system in China, the need for greater infrastructure investment in Brazil, the need to deal with corruption. And the, so it's not that the turnaround in emerging markets meant that emerging markets had eclipsed or had arrived, had eclipsed advanced nations where it had arrived at some nirvana of growth. That popular kind of narrative of emerging markets overtaking advanced economies missed the point. The point is that emerging markets had this tremendous decade and a half because they implemented reforms. And in order to continue to drive prosperity for their citizens, they needed to continue down that path. And that didn't happen. And because it hasn't happened, we're seeing this continued slowdown in emerging markets. And because we're not seeing the willingness of advanced nations to recognize much of the emerging markets, the third world nations in themselves and some of their own problems and, and adopt those structural reforms, we're not seeing much of a recovery there as well. And so weakness in both sets of economies, the unwillingness to embrace discipline has us in this period of stagnation and this, uh, and this downward tra trajectory of growth. If that sounds pessimistic, I'm not pessimistic. There's a way forward, but it requires humility on the part of the advanced nations and uh, continued commitment to the policies that generated the turnaround in the first place in emerging markets. And through all of this, there's a very, very important role for capital. So as much as we want to help labor, which is the right thing to do, we have to remember the capital and labor have to also engage in a positive sum narrative, not a zero sum narrative. And there's every reason to believe that's the case because we've seen it in the past. So with that, let me stop and take any questions that you might have. Thank you. <laughs>
unskilled jobs that pay high wages were a hallmark of the middle class in the US. We've had an erosion of those jobs. Yeah. This is certainly led to part of the income distribution problem we are having. You are saying we need discipline. Understand. You give an example of uh, Greece. Maybe the Germans have some points, but maybe debt relief should be part of it. Using that concept of discipline and that it is a give and take, do you have any prescriptions for the US? Great question. So what, is this, what, what would discipline look like in a US context, <clears throat> specifically to address the problem that you've raised? Like I think we have done a poor job in the United States of helping the middle class, the working class, adjust to the realities of globalization. And the jobs of which you spoke are not likely to come back in the form in which they left. So the question is, how do you take workers who are in those jobs and prepare them for the jobs of the future? And I don't think we've been serious enough about that. I guess it's going to require a number of things. Higher education is part of that solution. It's not the only solution. It's providing skills at a number of levels. And it's also about providing certification opportunities. So it's true that there is a growing shortage of high-skilled workers in this country. <coughs> and studies by McKinsey and others have documented that. But we also know from recent work that there are many workers who have skills but not credentials, meaning that there are those who are capable of doing uh, the, the work of college graduates, but you don't have a college degree, and because of that, are precluded from working in those jobs. And so we need to have a better means of, of, of allowing workers who have skills but not credentials to demonstrate that they're capable of doing those jobs. As well, frankly, as well as frankly, uh, providing more educational opportunities, uh, uh, not necessarily for a college education, but for workers to do uh, um, higher skilled manufacturing jobs that don't require a college education, but that require more than a, a high school education. And I think it's very important to realize that education, the benefits of an, of, of education, of an education, accrue to the individual who makes that investment. But companies also have an obligation because there's an externality associated with education. Namely, companies fish in a pool of skilled workers, high-skilled, medium-skilled, and semi-skilled workers. And to the extent that that's in the, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the national interest, there's a case to be made for greater contribution, greater contribution by US, by U.S. corporations to, let's call it a national pool, if you will, for creating greater access and creating <clears throat> a ratcheting up of the skills of, of the US, U.S. workforce. So I think, there have to be, I, think there have to, there, I think there has to be serious attention paid to this issue of skills and certification. We've paid lip service to it, but I don't think we've done enough to actually um, help the U.S. workforce adjust and prepare for 21st century jobs. <laughs> no, I think rather than talk about levels of taxes, I'd like us to think about the margins in the following sense, right? So what do we, what do we implicitly subsidize through our tax system? We implicitly subsidize home ownership up to a million dollars a year. Right? We don't have a commensurate anything at that level for those who want to invest, for instance, in a college education. 
So certainly there's a there's a there's a there's an there's a there's an onus on higher education as well to do everything that we in higher education can do to limit the rise of the cost of higher education. But there's also the need for us to have a sensible uh, tax system that incentivizes the kind of investment that we want to see. And I think there's also a need for corporations to play a role as well to recognize the public good that they benefit from in uh, in fishing in this pool of um, of uh, high, medium, and semi-skilled workers. Thank you for the question. I recognize what you say that uh, we're all concerned about getting more uh, educated workforce, but we have also seen these graphs where productivity is much higher than the wage. Yes, yeah, so, produ so pro pro productivity has been growing more more quickly than than than, than the wages. <laughs> uh, uh, for some time, and that's largely because it's been, the labor market has been there's been a lot of slack in the in the labor market. But I would also I also say that productivity growth has been disappointingly low, as well the last few years, and we need um, uh, investment to revitalize that as well. So there I mean there are a number of aspects of this problem. There's 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 investment in ed education to make to make workers more productive, but there's also uh, there's also been a, 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 a there was a fall in real investment and in real capital investment that that took place around the Great Recession, and investment levels still have not recovered to po to pre crisis to pre crisis levels, and that is a function of uh, not only the, the policy environment in the United States but I think more broadly the global policy environment that I alluded to and this lack of discipline. So. Yes, wages have, been, have not been rising as fast as productivity, but we also need productivity to, to rise more quickly than it, than, it, than it has. Firms need an incentive if they're to do what you recommend them to do, and either in terms of tax rebates or alternatively having the workers commit to the firms for a longer period of time in a fluid economy. The firm doesn't want to invest in someone who might leave and take that on-the-job training or whatever training they give. They can get the return easily. So how do you recommend that these firms make this move that you want them to make? Yeah, no, it's no question. Firms, firms respond to incentives for, prop for, for, for making profit. And I think, that the, I think the bigger issue is kind of a global macro issue, that we're in, a, we're in an equilibrium where there's diminished expectations about, um, about future output. Uh, because of this, this lack of uh, discipline on the part of a large number of nations coming out of the coming out of the crisis, and so the diminished expectations about essentially trend future growth rates has the impact today of making people feel poorer today and reducing spending today. So you get this impact of uh, lower expected future uh, growth rates of potential output having a, having an impact on actual output today. And lower expectations of growth um, today and in the future, in that environment, it's not surprising that firms are particularly eager uh, to go out and, and, and install new capital, capital equipment. And what's really needed to move us out of this equilibrium is um, a set of coordinated policies. I'm not saying that, we can, that all countries can coordinate all their policies across one another, but an agreement by governments to individually do, to get on with what it needs to be done in each of their individual economies to actually restore productivity and, and expectations about future growth. In the absence of that, I think it'll be very hard for any um, individual firm uh, to commit itself to a path of capital spending. And you can see that in many ways. I mean, whether, whether you, there's, there's incredible monetary stimulus at the moment, unprecedented monetary stimulus. In spite of record low interest rates, you're not seeing a recovery in capital spending. You're seeing rather firms buying back their shares. Why? Because the view is that it's more, it's, it, you can generate a better return by buying back your own shares than actually buying it and investing in, in new equipment. So that suggests to me that it's more of a macro policy issue then, then, uh, that, that needs, uh, we need a, a change in expectations about the future. And that, and that really doesn't, that's not about monetary policy. I think that's about real structural policy that sits at the, 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 the feet of lawmakers. Dr. Henry, um, 
How much of your uh, key uh, figure one is due to China, India, and the domination of some of the very large, relatively large economies that had uh, grown very rapidly? If you were to use uh, median growth rates, maybe you did that uh, already, but would the picture be essentially unchanged? You'd, you'd essentially get the same story. You'd essentially get the same story. I mean, uh, the Mexicos and the Brazils are not as, the, the, the increase is not as, is not as, as, as dramatic, uh, but there is certainly a substantial increase in the growth rate in those countries relative to the, what they had in the previous period. Um, but as we're seeing, going back to the, whoopsie, this figure here, not sure what I've done, but you can see uh, there's, been a, there's been a slowdown in emerging market growth. And that, whoopsie, I think we're going to cross purposes here. That's right. I can get back there now. Whoops. Here we are. We're all good now. Um, there's been a slowdown in emerging market growth. So yes, you take this average here versus this average here. Definitely an increase. But look at the, look at the tail end of this period. Growth in emerging markets still higher than, than in advanced economies, but the gap is narrowing. And the gap is narrowing in large part because it, um, certainly China's part of that, but also Brazil, Mexico uh, are not growing the way they did um, certainly in the late 2000s. You uh, stated that we should, uh, you're interested in the long run view. Yeah. So I, I guess I'd like to hear your views about the. Uh, two controversies regarding technology. Okay. So the first is uh, Robert Gordon's thesis that the productivity will not be as high as it has been uh, during the period you observed the high, high growth because mm -hmm. we've run out of the major innovations like the light bulb or internal combustion engine. And there's also uh, aging demographics, so uh, productivity will not be as high. And then the related argument about technology, technology uh, disrupts, but usually creates more jobs than it destroys. But some are arguing we, now we've reached a tipping point and technology will be destroying more jobs than it creates, which might be a problem for the 1.7 million uh, annually. Uh, you know, so artificial intelligence or something that's coming quickly, autonomous vehicles, you know, we won't need truck drivers or Uber drivers. So I, I'd just be curious about your long-term view about those two issues regarding technology. Right, those are big questions, great questions, big questions. So I guess the first point is I, I would just um, make the observation, which in some things you've already made, it's always been the case historically that <clears throat> there have been kind of Luddites against new technology um, with the fear that technology is going to destroy jobs, but in the end, it always ends up creating jobs by essentially creating higher incomes, and, and people people find new things to do. I tend to lean in that direction, uh, not knowing exactly what all those jobs are going to look like, but if you just think about the range of things that people are doing now, the opportunities for people to work remotely, uh, to do uh, sort of viewable kind of spot work, uh, in a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a more convenient part-time basis relative to what they were able to do 20 years ago because of technology, leads me to believe that technology in the end is still going to end up, as it creates uh, higher incomes, is going to somehow lead to more job creation, even though I, don't, I can't tell you exactly what that's going to look like. I do think that the concern about the absence of capital flows to emerging markets or capital accumulation in general to absorb labor is made even more severe by your observation. I mean, to the extent that <clears throat> in this world of automation and labor-saving capital innovations, the number of workers absorbed per unit of capital, if you will, is going to be lower than it was in the past that suggests the problem might be even worse than what I've described here. Um, let me also say that there's two other things. 
I think it's I think it's it's always been um, a bad idea to to, to bet against uh, human creativity. I mean, if you just think about the things that you know, the fact that what we can do with these is extraordinary, and no one could no one could have predicted this twenty years ago. So um, I'm not one to bet against the creativity of human beings in terms of new ideas being generated. Um, <clears throat> and their ability to generate economic growth. Then the last thing I'll say is I, th I think much of, we, we tend to think about productivity-driven growth stemming solely from ideas, new ideas. And certainly new ideas like being able to connect one computer to another through a network has had a tremendous impact on our ability to, to, to do things. But it's a really important to remember the importance of you know policy itself represents ideas, the way in which you organize your economy. And there's tremendous room for productivity gains just, for instance, by reforming labor market laws. So I would just say that even in the absence of new ideas and new technologies, there's scope for productivity gain just by getting economic policy right. So I'm less pessimistic about the potential for productivity gains in the next two decades than perhaps Robert Gordon is. But I'm not confident at the moment that we're seeing the kind of leadership we need to actually make those, those changes happen. And I think that, um, but I, but I do, but I, but I think that in general, we're under, we are underestimating the importance of policy. Right, just changing the way we organize the economy, the things we allow people to do to enable them to do to be dynamic, dynamically efficient or not, <laughs> to generate productivity, holding constant uh, technology per se. Hope that answers. Your question to some extent. Good. That makes two of us. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, oh, no. Okay, so I'd just like to make a comment, and I have two questions. And so, comment I really appreciate your graph with Barbados and Jamaica from the Bahamas, and I was hoping you would uh. put one up there too, just to show like <laughs> our growth. But like with your, um, so economics is not my field, so this might just be a simple question, but. Uh, with, um, to what extent did inflation, can inflation attenuate that graph for Jamaica versus Barbados? And then my second question is, um, it sounds like you're positing that there shouldn't be no ceiling effect for growth. And that, uh, so in terms of like, from a science background, limiting reagents, it sounds like you're saying for like emerging countries, then, well, everyone in particular, but the discipline, but what else would you say, if, if you were to say discipline, and then these two other factors for emerging uh, countries, what else would you say would be those limiting reagents for development? Got it. So to answer your, to your first question, <coughs> the figures I showed you were inflation adjusted. So those were, that, that was real growth. Um, it, your second question is related to the previous question in many respects. So um, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a lot of scope for what's called catch-up growth between for emerging markets to grow more quickly than advanced countries for some period of time because uh, they have lots of uh, labor, underutilized labor, and very little capital. And so by accumulating capital quickly and, 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 and moving labor out of um, uh, underutilized aspects into productive, uh, productive jobs, tremendous room to grow more quickly for some period of time until they get to what's, so what's, what's called uh, kind of the, the efficient frontier where they're essentially using means of production that are very similar to what are used in advanced countries. So an example of that would be, for, for instance, one might argue that places like South Korea, which had experienced very rapid growth in the 1970s and 1980s uh, and is now growing at, at seems like steady state rates that are much closer to other uh, advanced countries, that the scope for catch-up growth is, has, has, um, has been used up to some extent. Now, what's always been the case, this was uh, kind of the question that Jonathan was alluding to earlier, is that the continued development of new ideas 
allows countries to continue to, to, to grow uh, in spite of um, the scarcity of, 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 labor, of labor, labor and capital. So there's, uh, so there's a question of whether the frontier will continue to shift out over time because of, of technology, which is a separate question from whether advanced, emerging nations will uh, be able to grow more quickly than advanced nations until they catch up. Yeah. And so I think the, the consensus is we're both optimistic that the, the frontier will continue to, to, to shift a bit. Um, from the graph you have up here, you've showed us that uh, we're connected um, in growth globally. And my question is, uh, what I ideologies do you see as roadblocks? Are they political, religious, um, financial, cultural? Uh, what is stopping that? I no. think. That's yeah, a big question. Let me, uh, let me um, start with ideology, actually. Okay. So I think the... One of the main lessons that comes out when you stare at these GDP figures across countries and within countries for a while and really think about how it is that countries generate a turnaround when they did it is a theme of pragmatism. So I said, you know, when I said well, discipline means a sustained commitment to a pragmatic growth strategy. <laughs> and so a focus on efficiency as opposed to um, saying, you know, small government is better than large government or large government's better than small government uh, or saying, um, you know, you know, no taxes on X, Y, or Z. What works, what's going to work in one country country A versus country B is largely dependent on where the, uh, where the bottlenecks are. And what you learn by looking at these various examples over time is that it, 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 different things work for different countries. So take a country like China. Um, when, uh, when Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978 in a communist China, you know, he made the remark, I don't care if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice, which is basically saying, I don't care about ideology, I want to generate growth. And China took a series of small reforms, starting with land, agrarian land reform, that put it on a new, on a new, on a, on a new trajectory. And then free economic zones and so-called you know, socialism with, with, uh, with market characteristics. And I think, so the big lesson that I take from, from, from China is that discipline is pragmatic, right? Um, now, the Chinese model has run into some challenges, right? But I'll take 25 years of, of growth. Okay, now, yes, yeah, so are the obstacles political? Well, you know, there are examples of countries that do efficient things that are democracies, and there's some examples of countries that do efficient things that are, that are autocracies. I like democracy. <laughs> um, I mean, the good news is that there are examples of democratically organized countries that are actually able to implement pragmatic growth strategies. Now, discipline is, appears to be cyclical, and we're entering a phase of, we're, we're in a phase of where there's a lack of discipline. But if you take a country even like Indonesia, <coughs> uh, which certainly has its challenges as to other emerging markets right now. But in 1990, uh, 1997, and during the Asian crisis, when Suharto was in charge in Indonesia as an autocrat, who would could have predicted that, that Indonesia would be a Muslim democracy, achieve, having achieved relatively um, substantial growth 
over the 18 year period following Saharta. So to me, that gives me some, op that, that gives me some optimism. Um, and that says to me that what really matters here is efficiency, pragmatism over ideology. Now, there's a real challenge to maintaining this non-zero-sum mindset. <coughs> so let me give you an example. So this, these emerging economies that now account for more than half of global growth, um, for a long time, were disproportionately underrepresented in the voting shares at institutions like the International Monetary Fund, where key global economic policies get set. That's just finally been rectified. They, they, the IMF uh, went through what's called a quota adjustment, which was um, appro approved in 2010, but wasn't actually ratified or actually by the United States until just last December. So it took five years. And frankly, um, the unwillingness of the United States to actually ratify and allow IMF reform to go forward to give emerging markets a greater voting share in the IMF uh, is, a, is, a, is a precisely the kind of zero-sum thinking that puts the world economy at danger. Right? So in that, what have we seen in, the, in, that, in that interim five-year period while the U.S. was using its 15% um, voting share at the IMF, uh, which requires an 85% vote of all members for any reform to go through, so the U.S. effectively has veto power. In that five-year period, we've seen the rise of um, the, uh, the BRICS Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, <coughs> and a number of other responses and prior to that, there's the, the, the creation of the Chiang Mai Initiative following, following the Asian crisis as an alternative response to the Bretton Woods institutions because of what I call the trust deficit, that emerging markets, having implemented these reforms that drove their turnaround and growth, found themselves excluded or not included in a commensurate way uh, at the table for making global economic policy. And so the danger of that is not that emerging economies shouldn't have a voice and create their own institutions, but if these institutions are created out of spite, as an alternative that doesn't embrace some of the, the practices that we've learned are good practices over the last roughly 70 years since the creation of Bretton Woods, and more importantly, it's just done out of a zero-sum mindset, then we have, a, we have a problem. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Dr. Henry, would you say that the zero-sum growth mentality that exists within the country can be found in depressed, historically depressed areas like the Appalachians, um, where you have lower median income, or that the idea that growth and development in rural areas is done at the expense of urban areas? I suspect there are important parallels there. There's an interesting new book that I haven't had a chance to read yet that I highly recommend you read. So I mentioned earlier, and I'm not just trying to plug my, my institution here, but I mentioned Antoine von Ackmill, who's a NYU Stern alum, who coined the phrase emerging markets. He's got a new book out called um, The Smartest Places on Earth. And he's basically arguing the smartest places on earth um, might just be uh, depressed, uh, depressed urban areas. Um, and I suspect there's a potential argument there about rural areas as well. So I point you in that in that direction. But I suspect there are some parallels, right? Because because the, the real because the question is, <coughs> how do you how do you create policies uh, that generate uh, that generate prosperity in those in those in those regions? And I think there are probably are some parallels to to the uh, emerging markets. You mentioned earlier that education plays a role in economic growth. How do you think educators and economists can come together to help address the issue of education hindering economic development? Yeah, good question. I think we both need to continue to press, and press a, a, a two-sided agenda. I think educators, particularly those just in higher education, need to speak honestly about um, 
the rising cost of higher education, and that the same forces that are uh, driving income inequality and driving up the wages of very highly skilled people, um, accountants and doctors and, and dentists and, 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 and consultants, those forces are also driving up the cost of providing a higher education because uh, the main cost in higher education is this group of folks called faculty who are part of a global labor force and are highly in demand because they're highly skilled people. And so the question is, how do we use technology as we move forward to make the most cost-effective use of these highly skilled, highly paid individuals called, called faculty to contain the rise in the cost of higher education in a way that's sustainable? But then uh, policymakers or uh, an econ economists need to, need to also point out that education is a public good. And it's a public good that provides positive externalities to society, and in particular to companies, as I mentioned earlier. And any time there's a positive externality, there's, in principle, an argument to be made for some uh, subsidy, uh, some uh, support for that activity. So I don't want to sound like I'm asking for a handout for higher education from corporations. As I said, higher education needs to do its part to keep cost growth down. But corporations are fishing in this pool of talent called the US labor force. And there, I think there's a tragedy of the commons analogy there. They're fishing from this, from this pool, from this lake, but not helping to replenish it with fish. So by creating greater access, by um, creating some sort of a, <coughs> a pool potentially, or, pay, or paying into such a pool, uh, you can imagine corporations doing more than they're currently doing, and some are doing some are doing a lot, but they, but could do more to create greater access for students to obtain all kinds of uh, higher education and, and 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 skills 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 upgrade. So I think some so I think that's the way in which I think economists and educators need to work together to articulate these issues so that the the general public and particularly the private sector can see that it's in their interest uh, to create greater access, even as higher education does what it needs, what it what it has to do to contain costs. Question just about free trade. Um, it's a two-parter. One is basically that we often talk about free trade and its benefits in a very uh, idealistic sense. But when we look at free trade agreements like even NAFTA, after all the phase-ins, there are still protections on softwood, lumber, dairy, et cetera. And are you concerned that we're sort of talking about two different scenarios? One is that there's an idealistic sense, and then a, a realistic sense, which is that sometimes these free trade agreements are not entirely free trade, um, as professors like Jagwish Bhagwati would argue. Second question is uh, Thomas Piketty's recent book, from, well, actually three years ago, talked about the return on uh, capital versus the return on labor and the differences between them, that, that capital returns more capital, basically. Are you concerned that there's a, we might be facing a macroeconomic have and have nots based on those who have access to these higher capital that returns higher capital returns, or rates, rather. Got it. So the first question, yes, I mean, we've got a long way to go on trade agreements. And there's still many distortions in the system. Um, there's not as much free trade as there should be because of various interest groups. But I'll also say that, um, Getting back to a question that was answered, asked, asked earlier, I think by the gentleman in the, in the Red Wings uh, jersey, um, we have, you know, we haven't, we've only, we've, we've largely paid lip service to helping people adjust to the real costs of free trade. So, yes, we needed more to, re to remove um, uh, unjustifiable subsidies uh, and open borders to greater free trade, but I think we also need to do a better job of helping people to adjust to. to the cost of free trade. On the question with respect to uh, on capital, um, you know, the title of this lecture really is in large, large, in some ways a response. That's why I call it Capital and Labor in the 21st Century, as opposed to Piketty's book, which is Capital in the 21st Century. And here's my basic point. I mean, I, th I sort of think I've made the point that policies that are good for capital are also good for labor. 
Now, policies that are good for capital may not be as good for labor as that you may, say, may not be as good for labor as they are for capital. In other words, there could be there there might be unequal returns. Um, but from where I sit and my background, coming from a poor country, and seeing the consequences in absolute terms to poor people, and the working and, and the working class in a poor country is much worse off than the working class in <coughs> this country. The damage that's done um, by putting in place policies that are trying to equalize the distribution of income um, are really severe. And so I often ask the question, I, I say to students, imagine a world in which everyone's income grows at 2% per year versus a world in which um, capital's income grows at 7% per year and labor's income grows at 4% per year. Would you rather be, you know, labor in that first world or that second world? I'd rather my income grow at 4% per year, even if my income's, the capital's income's growing even more quickly. So I think we often forget about, I mean, yes, it's important to, to think about inequality. And that example is a little bit contrived. But the point I wanted to make today <clears throat> is that we can't forget that just raising all average income is a really good thing. <laughs> and particularly in poor countries, where the difference between uh, your income doubling in 16 years versus 29 years could be the difference between you know, families being at, subsist at subsistence level or starving versus being able to send their kids to school. So um, I'm not saying that income inequality is a first world problem. <laughs> But I'm saying, let's not forget the lessons of history and get carried away and push for policies that are ultimately might undermine um, rising prosperity, particularly when we know we've got 1.7 million people per month to absorb in the labor force over the next 15 years in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you all. You've been a good audience. But I'd like to thank Peter very much for coming to Oakland University to give this Alice Gordon Memorial Lecture, and I'd like to present him with the Alice Gordon Memorial Award for Excellence in the Field of International Economics, presented by the Business School at Oakland University. Thank you for the coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please join us ac across the corridor for coffee, cookies, and punch. Have a good evening. <laughs>